This is Epicenter, episode 302 with guests Anthony Sassano and Eric Connor. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Voltoro, the gold hedging platform for the crypto community. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to voltoro.gold slash epicenter to get early access to their V2 platform and to start trading. And by Trail of Bits. Don't leave your project's security audit to just any firm. Trust a team with decades of experience at the forefront of blockchain security research. Go to trailofbits.com to learn more. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Sonny Agarwal. Hey, Sonny. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Happy to have you uh, across the table in the studio. Yeah. In Berlin. Yeah. So, uh, I think it's the first time I've done an episode like face to face. So yeah. I'm really enjoying this post video era. Yeah, it's very different from the video era, that's for sure. So we were just at Berlin Blockchain Week and I was actually very happy and kind of surprised to hear people kind of randomly come up to me and be like, hey, you know, it was probably a good move for you to stop doing video. Uh, so that was very comforting because I, I went into this and making this decision with some hesitation. And so I was uh, happy to hear that people were totally fine with it. Most of the people I met to, they're like, oh, I, you know, I, didn't even, I never listened to it on YouTube yeah. anyways. But yeah, so lots to talk about today. Today's interview is with Anthony Sassano and Eric Connor of Ethub. Our interview with them, I guess, maybe about a week ago or two weeks ago. And yeah, it was an interesting conversation. I mean, I, I follow them on Twitter and you get to see sort of the discussions on Twitter, but to get to talk to them in person uh, was, was interesting. It was slightly, I think maybe it'll be slightly controversial just because of the things that were said surrounding you know, parody's role in the community. And yeah, I think it kind of ties in nicely with current context of Blend Up Blockchain Week, which was last week, where you know, parody and Gnosis had their events kind of overlap with each other. Yeah. And then keep in mind, Eric works for Gnosis as well. So, right. Of course. That's a good thing to point out. So, well, what are your high level thoughts on or takeaways on, on Blockchain Week? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a really cool event, uh, week. You know, I was kind of running around all week uh, from event to event, had a lot of different panels. Uh, I guess you could say like the three highlight events were like the Web3 Summit, uh, DAPCon, and then ETH Berlin. But then throughout that, there were just like meetups all over the place. I went, I was speaking at a Binance meetup. I was at a uh, governance game. So there was some interoperability stuff. And then, of course, just as all these weeks go, a lot of every time you get a lot of crypto people in a city together, there's always a lot of parties as well. Yeah, I think Wednesday there were 20 different competing uh, <laughs> events and parties going on. It was absolutely yeah. ridiculous. I went to Web3 on Monday. I took Tuesday off and then I went to DAPCON on Wednesday and Thursday. I mean, I've got a couple of things here and maybe we can talk about this. So one of the things that was very apparent this year is that compared to last year is that last year was when I guess the world started becoming introduced to a lot of the DeFi protocols that... Uh, are now pretty commonplace in the space, so like Maker, Compound, Uniswap, you know, AirSwap, and these. Was Compound even out back then? No, it, actually, no, it wasn't. I think Uniswap had maybe just come out. Maker was like right. less than six months yeah. old. So this year, a lot of that stuff has now moved into. Well, there's two things. So one is all of the UX around that stuff has become much, much, much better. So we have like wallets that allow you to open a CDP in a few clicks and. and lend ether into and, and die into compound so like wallets like argent for example uh, have really done a really great job there and the other thing is that a lot of these base level protocols are now themselves being sort of some plant supplanted by other derivatives and so that's where like a lot of this has exploded where there's all these other types of derivatives being built on top of Compound and Maker. CDI, RDI, and ETH Berlin, there was just LSDI now. Yeah, I don't even know what, I saw it this morning, <laughs> I don't even know what that is. But So yeah, there's layers upon layers of derivatives being uh, built on all these kind of DeFi fundamentals. My other takeaway from this week is that we haven't yet seen the kind of mass adoption that a lot of us, I think, have aspired to in the last couple of years. The user experience around DeFi is getting much, much better. But the people that are using these protocols 
are still very much the builders. And we're still waiting for a, a massive influx of non-crypto savvy users. Like I don't expect everyone and their mom to start using crypto and to start leveraging DeFi for investing, but it would be nice to start seeing more of the educated investor class uh, of people come into this space and leverage DeFi as a high risk investment, for example. So I hope that we'll look back on the next you know, two to three years as the years where we saw that kind of investor come into the space. And I hope that that will be great for the ecosystem as a whole. That's interesting that you think that the what non crypto people come in to do is the primarily just investment, not 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 much else, not like as are there any other use cases other than investment? I mean, I think in Ethereum that's probably the primary one. I do agree, for example, with like Ryan Selkis that like Ethereum is basically reserve currency for a decentralized investment fund. I don't think that's necessarily the case for something like Cosmos or Bitcoin, but I think for Ethereum that that is somewhat true. Would you agree with that? I don't know. I, I guess it's still being figured out. I mean, this is kind of what this episode goes into, which yeah. is, you know, these guys, Eric and Anthony, they've been really doing a lot of the work in drive, in figuring out this narrative of Ethereum. And not that everyone agrees with them necessarily. Like, you know, interestingly, I was ch- chatting with uh, Martin Kopelman from Gnosis, as well as uh, Udi Wertheimer. Uh, by the way, it was super awesome that he was here. I had a really good time chatting with him throughout this week. And even Martin was like, you know, yeah, he did, he doesn't buy this whole ETH is money concept either. And it seems to me that in this episode, we'll see that, like, you know, I think Eric and Anthony seem to make it think that it's like, oh, this is like the dominant narrative. And I think it's maybe a little bit of loud voices. But I think even within one company, like I said, Eric works for Gnosis and Martin does, disagrees with this. And so I think there's still a lot of soul searching to be done for Ethereum. Yeah, n- narratives are still uh, changing and evolving over time. Yeah. And then the, I think the other thing also that we saw this this year uh, compared to last is like just the proliferation of DAOs as a way to govern and fund different community eff- efforts. So you know, we've had I mean on the show to talk about Moloch and we haven't had them on the show yet, but like obviously like Meta Cartel has become a very large organization, yep. uh, both in terms of the funding in the DAO and also like the people that are involved there. I think they had an event here with like over 100 people. There's a Yang DAO, the Yang DAO. Humanity DAO. I was actually moderating uh, a panel on governance at DAPCON, as well as on like the governance games event that uh, Anna from Zero Knowledge is hosting. And in the past, when I like usually used to talk about governance, the conversation is usually mostly I felt around protocol governance about like how do we decide how to hard fork in Ethereum versus Tezos versus Bitcoin. This time, I just felt all the governance discussion was specifically around DAOs. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, that's a really interesting point too. So it was a it was a great great week. I think we, there's a lot of things that we've learned here. We uh, recorded an episode of Epicenter Live, which will go out. We need the, to get the recording, but I think it'll probably go out next week. And uh, I'll also try to get the recording for each of our respective panels, so that we can uh, also release those uh, like we did at the ICF event a couple of months ago. So look forward to those. And one more announcement: I will be at uh, Tel Aviv Blockchain Week. You haven't confirmed yet if you're going, but I think you should come. Okay. Uh, so Tel Aviv Blockchain Week uh, is sort of overlapping over from like the 9th of September to like the 17th of September, uh, even over the weekend. So there is the Scaling Bitcoin Conference. There is the uh, Ethereal Summit on Sunday, this 15th. And the Star Wars Sessions is on the 16th, on the Monday. I'll be there throughout the week. We're going to be doing a meetup. So if you're in... Tel Aviv for any of those events and would like to come and hang out with me and maybe other Epicenter hosts if Sunny you decide to come along. Uh, we'll be doing a meetup there and you can go to epicenter.rocks slash Tel Aviv 2019 to register. Uh, we don't have a venue or a date yet, but we'll be finalizing that this week. We had a great one here in Berlin. We had like over 40 people show up. It was awesome. Yeah, uh, I, w- I do want to get into that. But yeah, so the Tel Aviv Blockchain Week uh, meetup, you can go to epicenter.rock slash Tel Aviv 2019 to register. And as soon as the venue is finalized and the date also, we'll, we'll send an email. But yeah, the meetup was really terrific. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who came there. It's one of my favorite things to meet Epicenter listeners. And uh, you, you came in large numbers this year. So thank you. So with that, here's our interview with Eric Connor and Anthony Sassano of ETH Hub. Hi, so we're here with Anthony Sassano and Eric Connor. Uh, they are both 
founders of ETHHUB, an educational platform for the Ethereum community that has some great documentation about Ethereum, a podcast, and a newsletter. And uh, they've been doing ETHHUB for, I think, about since January. And uh, Anthony is a product marketing manager at SET, and Eric is a product manager at Gnosis. Thanks for joining us, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So I'd like to ask each of you individually, perhaps starting with Eric, what drove you to Ethereum initially? What drove you to that community? Yeah, so I actually initially got involved with Bitcoin in 2013, which I feel like that's how a lot of people got started, right? And my background's actually in finance. I was working at a bank and ran across Bitcoin and the idea in general just fascinated me. Um, I actually started day trading it at that point, which wasn't the best of ideas because I ended up losing a lot of Bitcoin that I could have today, but I learned a lot of valuable lessons and kind of got very just enthralled with the technology. And, you know, at that time, Mt. Gox had got hacked and a lot of my friends that were traders lost a lot of Bitcoin. So, you know, just about that time as well, Vitalik was giving his introduction to Ethereum at Bitcoin Miami conference. And we said, you know, why are all these people trading these decentralized assets on centralized exchanges? It doesn't make much sense. Why don't we try and leverage this new technology to build something better? So three of us set out to build EtherX, which was kind of the first attempt at a decentralized exchange on Ethereum in late 2014, early 2015. Fortunately, the project never fully got off the ground due to just some internal turmoil, I guess I'll put it. But, you know, the EtherX is still out there on GitHub if anybody ever wants to revive it. Or, you know, I think some of the white paper ideas are still pretty relevant today, which is very interesting. But, you know, ever since then, I've just been involved in the community, going to meetups, helping build out the community, mainly on social media like Reddit and Twitter, just bringing general awareness and learning as much as I can. And then, you know, I met Anthony in 2018. We had the idea of ETHUB. Like you mentioned, we launched it um, January 2019 this year. And then, you know, working full time in the space now at Gnosis. So it just kind of has been a slow evolution over the years from just, you know, learning about Bitcoin and then being fascinated about the ideas behind Ethereum and now just full time in the space. So I got started in 2013 as well with Bitcoin. Basically, I uh, discovered it through a friend. Uh, you know, bought some Bitcoin, uh, followed it up all the way to uh, whatever it was, $1,000, followed it the way back down. Uh, in 2014, I kind of like just sold off what I had and kind of exited the space altogether, which obviously was a very big mistake <laughs> for me. Uh, and then I rediscovered uh, crypto back early 2017 with Ethereum. I read a, a few posts about Ethereum and I was like, oh, well, this is like totally different to, to Bitcoin. Like it does a lot more than what Bitcoin can do or the base layer and everything. So I got kind of enthralled with that, uh, with what Ethereum could do. Just spent 2017 basically doing, I guess, a, you know, very similar to what a lot of other people would have been doing in 2017, which was speculating a lot, uh, especially with the ICO craze and everything. Uh, so I don't think I actually learned much in 2017 <laughs> uh, besides like how to speculate, I guess. And then uh, obviously after the crash uh, happened again, I didn't exit this time. I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Uh, so I basically spent 2018 learning as much as I could. Uh, early 2018, I started a website called Block by Block, uh, where it had like a bunch of resources and research links for crypto that I collected. And I shared that with everyone in the community. I uh, started a newsletter called the Block by Block Weekly Newsletter in April of 2018, I think it was maybe earlier than that. Uh, yeah, so I started that and I, I did that. And then um, towards the end of 2018, I met Eric. Uh, we, have, we haven't actually met in real life. We just um, kind of met in, online, uh, you know, both being involved with the Ethereum community. And we, we thought, hey, we should start something uh, because, you know, there's not much for Ethereum at the moment in terms of education. There's a lot of stuff happening no one really knows about. So we started ETHUB together and that went live early 2019. Uh, and we've got the newsletter now and the podcast and everything. So yeah, the rest is history, I guess. Uh, I only recently joined SET in July, actually July 15th was my official start date there. So yeah, it's been been quite an interesting journey. Wow, it's incredible that you've never met in person. Uh, that, that's quite a long time working together, not having face-to-face -face contact. When, when Brian and I started Epicenter, we didn't meet for I think like two months. We met two months after, but yeah, it's like eight eight months is a long time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We're we we joke. Hopefully, when we meet in person, it doesn't all fall apart since we work so well remote. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I was listening to your podcast. You guys are going to be meeting in uh, Berlin. Yeah, the funny thing is, is that we're both like really close to each other at the moment because I'm in San Francisco and he's in LA. Uh, but we actually aren't meeting in California. We're going to meet at Berlin. <laughs> it's just quite funny. Well, that's a good place to meet. Yeah, exactly. So what was what it about the Ethereum community that you guys thought was attractive and that you, maybe you didn't find in other communities? 
I guess for me, I mean, when I first got started, like I mentioned, I was more got involved on the trading side of Bitcoin. And at the time, to be honest, a lot of the Bitcoin community was pretty just fascinated on price and the, the wild price movements that were happening. And like I mentioned, saw these exchange hacks and, you know, I was more fascinated about the underlying technology. I mean, obviously everybody wants to make money and we need these things to go up to secure the networks and all that good stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, what captured me was this idea that you could start to build applications on top of this technology, right? And, and that idea just fascinated me. I mean, the possibilities seemed endless. And pretty much at that point, I decided to drop all my Bitcoin and go you know, dedicate all my time to Ethereum. So when you say you know, dedicated all your time, one thing when I met Anthony for the first time, you know, I think at EdCon just earlier this year uh, in 2019 is I, I was actually surprised to learn that both of you actually weren't like working in the blockchain space. You know, you were kind of following along and you, you, you've, been, you've been working on ETUB for you know, quite a while, actually. But why, why did you decide like, you know, to kind of be very actively involved with the space, but not jump in like as, as your full time job kind of thing? Yeah, I guess for me, it was, uh, I guess, mostly geographic, uh, geographically challenged, I like to call it, uh, because I live down in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, there's not much happening there, unfortunately, uh, for, for crypto in the crypto community. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, over the last few months, uh, and the reason why I was able to kind of land a job was because crypto companies are much more open to remote work than uh, other sorts of companies. So I'm working with Set remotely from Melbourne at the moment. But uh, prior to that, I think I had been kind of looking for a job in crypto. It's just that nothing really kind of came up that would that would work for me I, in my case, I guess, just because of like in, in Melbourne, it's actually a 17 hour time difference from San Francisco, uh, 17 hours ahead, which is quite crazy. So a lot of the stuff that would require me to be kind of like in sync with the team, like at, at all times, uh, wouldn't work. But in terms of like what I do for set now, it's um, marketing. So it doesn't re really require me to be, you know, on at the same time as them, I work in, you know, in my own time when I can, uh, basically, like I'm asleep pretty much like when the business hours are happening in San Francisco. So yeah, I think that's mainly what came down to for me, kind of like finding the right role that would allow me to work uh, remote uh, on such an extreme time difference. How do you manage to record a podcast with a 17 hour time difference? How is that even possible? That's either one of us either has to be up very early or very late. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> I'm hoping uh, maybe Anthony can make the move over to San Francisco someday. That would be the ideal setup. <laughs> well, kudos to you guys for for doing the podcast uh, for so long and, and still sticking with it uh, um, with uh, with these constraints. So moving to ETHUB now. So let's dive into what what is ETHUB and why did you decide to to start this? Yeah, I guess at the core of it, I mean, to be honest, how it was going to start or how it started was, you know, Ether price was falling from the top of, you know, $1,420 all the way down to 80. And during that time, there was just a lot of obviously everyone was emotional and kind of freaking out on, you know, whether it be Twitter, Reddit, blog posts, whatever it might be. Um, and there was a lot of misinformation being spread about Ethereum. And, you know, we kind of got together and you know, how can there's nowhere to point people to like say, okay, here's what's actually going on, or here's what developments are actually taking place. So, originally, the idea was going to be basically just like a FUD fighter FAQ where you know we would see our favorite top 10 Ethereum FUD items and you know rebut them and say why they're not true. It kind of evolved quickly from there into hey, there's also no Ethereum based podcasts, there's you know very few Ethereum based newsletters, but you know, at, still at the core of it is. The documentation and you know i still personally struggle explaining ethereum to people family and friends that have never heard about it um there's just not a good place to point people and it's you know we're kidding ourselves if we think it's an easy concept to understand right like bitcoin has done a pretty good job at making an explainable narrative to people uh digital gold is something that you know people can understand ethereum hasn't quite found that you know easily explainable narrative yet. So, you know, I think you still have to consume a lot of information to really understand it. And, you know, at, at the core, that's the goal of Ethub. I think maybe in part, that's also because to some extent, Ethereum hasn't yet found really like what its primary sort of use case is, whereas like Bitcoin has this digital gold thing where with Ethereum, it's still a bit fluid and changing with time, right? 
I do think Bitcoin's changed with time as well. Maybe not an, as an extreme change, but it's definitely changed with time. Uh, back in 2013, uh, there wasn't really much talk about this store of value digital gold kind of thing. It was more about payments and getting merchants to accept it and all these sorts of things, right? I guess that's what Bitcoin Cash is these days. Uh, kind of like that community forked off into Bitcoin Cash and, you know, they're doing all that stuff over there, whereas Bitcoin's kind of you know, solidify itself as digital gold, store of value, macro hedge, all that good stuff, I guess. But yeah, you're definitely right. Where Ethereum kind of, because by design, it can do a lot more. Uh, we're still kind of like finding what the best fit is, uh, where, you know, where the use cases are, where the product market fit is. I do think something like DeFi is, you know, uh, really great and, and found like a really, really great product market fit within Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is pretty much like kind of like built for that. If I, am, if I was to, to say like what I think Ethereum will be, going forward as well. Uh, but definitely other things like DAOs and uh, just general Web3 apps like decentralized social media and all that sort of stuff. Definitely, uh, I think Ethereum can still do that. I just think that the platform being limited in scale uh, will obviously limit those use cases. And I think the financial use cases are probably very interesting to most people because of the fact that you can possibly make money from it, right? Uh, at the end of the day, a lot of people are in uh, the crypto space because they want to make money. I think if we're honest about that, then we can build apps that people actually want to use. Yeah. And just to add something quickly to that too, I think one of the problems Ethereum had early on is a bit of mismarketing that we're still paying a bit for. I think we're just getting out of it. But if you actually read the initial white paper, most of the use cases explained by Vitalik have to do with programmable money and financial use cases, right? About a year after it launched, Ethereum went down this path of world computer and Web3, which I think someday we'll get to, but it was way too early for Ethereum, right? And so we're kind of recovering a bit from that narrative that didn't really fit early on and kind of getting back to more of the basics on the financial side. And I, I think, you know, DeFi personally, I think is a great narrative for now for Ethereum. This is kind of what I was looking at as well, like during that whole 2017 period where I thought everyone was just way too overexcited by Web3 and all these like, decentralized applications and stuff. And from what I saw it as, it, you know, I just think that we should focus on the financial applications. And to me, smart contracts should be used exactly what they sound like, which is as contracts and like, you know, for usually for particularly mostly financial purposes. And if you're trying to build anything much more complex than uh, some basic contracting stuff, I'm not sure if Ethereum is the is ready today for to, to handle that kind of load. If you're holding a significant portion of your net worth in crypto, you're probably waiting for your portfolio to moon at any time. But holding crypto doesn't mean you should be irresponsible in the face of volatility risk. That's where Voltoro comes in. Voltoro is the leading gold hedging solution for the crypto community. And as a stable asset trusted for millennia, gold is the perfect long-term hedging solution. And at Epicenter, we've been using Voltoro since 2014 to protect a portion of our company's assets against volatility. Now, you might ask, why not use a stablecoin, Seb? Which is a great point, and don't get me wrong, stablecoins are great and a real benefit for crypto adoption. But algorithmic stablecoins are still a very new and experimental asset type, and some asset-backed stablecoins have been scrutinized for being under-reserved. With Voltoro, your gold is 100% insured and secured in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains, protected by Brinks. Every single gram of gold is audited, and holdings are made transparently available on their website for anyone to verify. And most importantly, it's quite literally your gold. You can choose to have it delivered to you at any time. To learn more and to get access to Voltoro's brand new V2 platform, which includes an interface overhaul and trading in Dash, Litecoin, Ether, and Silver, go to voltoro.gold slash epicenter. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O dot gold slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Voltoro for their support of the podcast. At uh, Ethub, so currently, is it just the two of you or is there anyone else kind of involved in it today? Yeah, so uh, in terms of like, I guess you could say full time. We're, we're, I mean, it's a it's a it's a passion project. At the end of the day, uh, we started it. We actually just us two, of course. But then we had kind of like some core contributors come on board that um, submitted a lot of content uh, with us. So one of those is Chaz Schmidt. Uh, he's um, had been very helpful uh, early on uh, in getting a lot of the documentation on there. Uh, he's actually currently working on like translating EthHub as well. Uh, which is really cool. But yeah, in terms of like ongoing uh, maintenance and work on it, uh, it's mostly yeah, Eric and I, but anyone can go to the GitHub repo and uh, submit, you know, pull requests or whatever and content that they want added. The people who have commit access is uh, obviously Eric and I, Chaz, and I think one other person uh, from memory. 
uh, that can commit these things. But you know, like we never really deny anyone unless it's like advertising or something got to do with an ICO or something like that or, or scammy. Uh, so anyone can submit like educational content. Uh, but in terms of like the podcast and newsletter, that's kind of like centralized. Like I do the newsletter, Eric will do the guest podcast, uh, and then we'll do the, the weekly recap together. I got to say that the documentation website is just fantastic. I, mean, I don't spend a lot of time in Ethereum as much as I used to or sort of researching Ethereum. So today I just went through all the docs and like read everything. And it was such a great refresher on everything that's happening in Ethereum. Just get a great overview. And I think to someone who's coming into the space or maybe who's coming from another community or even from traditional software development that wants to just spend three or four hours just learning like 90% basically of what they need to learn about Ethereum to, to be up to date. It's, it's an ideal place to do it. So congratulations on, on building this like really nice, clean and simple resource. Yeah. Thanks. It's good to hear. I poked around some of the docs, especially like things around the monetary policy and stuff, which is like kind of stuff I'm maybe the least familiar with when I, when, when, but what kind of sections do you find personally the most interesting to write or the most rewarding? Or do you think that is really what like uh, brings maybe the majority of your audience, what are, what are people most interested in, in learning about when it comes to uh, reading the ETOP docs? No, that's a great question. I think as far as like personally rewarding, and I probably, I think, speak for Anthony and myself here, is the things that are very complex topics that, you know, information is kind of spread on GitHub or on Gitter or in chat rooms. And we can kind of take that and piece it together and make it easily digestible for most people. Um, you know, I would say the good examples there are around like Plasma and Layer 2 solutions and the different phases of ETH 2.0. I think our most popular pages that people go to and ask for are around the transition from ETH 1 to ETH 2 and how that's going to take place because there's multiple different phases. And then people are very interested in the transition from proof of work to proof of stake and you know how that's going to work how much ether they need you know how are they going to run it themselves what kind of rewards are they looking at getting back those are definitely our most popular pages i mean as far as like actual hit wise we're actually linked on the ethereum.org site now a few places um so some of the more basic like how to get a wallet and things are technically our most hit pages but as far as getting the most community interest i think it's around those you know topics that it's hard for people to understand unless it's all put on just one page in kind of like an explain like I'm five type uh, language. Yeah, definitely. I do second that. Uh, I think that we have a section on there called uh, the Ethereum FAQ section, which I think pays a lot of dividends. Uh, it's basically just like the most kind of like asked questions that we see on Twitter or Reddit or see that people are kind of like spreading misinformation about. So it's basically just a page that we can, or well, a bunch of pages that we can link to people to say, you know, here's the explanation, here's why this is wrong, instead of repeating ourselves constantly on Twitter. Uh, it's just like this holistic page, which I think has paid the most dividends uh, in terms of like, uh, you know, getting the uh, misinformation corrected and, and educating more people about like these core things. Like there's a, there's a few things in there about kind of, do you need Ether to, you know, use the Ethereum network as part of gas and things like that and explaining economic abstraction and meta transactions and, and a few more complex topics that people sometimes try to spin as like a negative for Ethereum. That's a great idea. <laughs> I think uh, I think I might I might do that as well for certain certain topics. So switching gears a little bit, let's let's take a step back a little bit and look at the Ethereum community as a whole. Can you describe what you see as the sort of state of the Ethereum community at the moment? So I guess um, it's changing. It's definitely changing. I think that. Uh, there is definitely people that are getting that are getting kind of disenfranchised with the community. Uh, they might not feel like they belong anymore. Uh, they may feel like they're being uh, pushed out or they don't align with the uh, kind of uh, vision and mission of Ethereum these days. I think that's just like going to be a natural thing. Uh, we obviously saw this happen with Bitcoin, uh, right, with the Bitcoin Cash fork and everything like that. And to an extent, the Bitcoin SV fork, there are always going to be people in different groups that have different values uh, that want to do different things. Uh, no one's going to have a holistic narrative. You can't please everyone. I think at the end of the day, we can only do our best to please, you know, the most amount of people. So I definitely think that's what's happening in Ethereum at the moment, especially with the transition from ETH1 to, to ETH2. A lot of the ETH2 teams, uh, especially the ones building clients, are new. They weren't around for ETH1. Uh, they weren't around until recently. Uh, so there's, I think, nine teams at the moment, and most of them only popped up over the last year or so, year or two maybe. Uh, whereas, you know, the, um, the old guard, as you, you know, as you can probably call it, uh, has been around since the beginning, like the Geths and the, the parodies of the world. 
Uh, and, you know, even in that arena, Parity's now moving on. Uh, I mean, they're still working on Ethereum, but they also have Polkadot that they're working on now as part of, you know, with the Web3 Foundation and things like that. So, yeah, there's definitely divide in the community at this point uh, in certain parts of the community. But I think that's just a natural occurrence uh, that will happen to any network, that, any crypto network that gets big enough. How does that divide express itself in reality? Where do we see it the most emerge? I think uh, you can see it like, unless you're really in the weeds, it's kind of hard to tell, I think, where people are going and where the divides are happening. But I think if you want to see like any obvious examples of, of divides happening, it may be any kind of uh, projects that or developers that have been traditionally pretty, you know, deep in Ethereum, building on Ethereum, moving over to other chains, maybe that may align with their vision more. Uh, but I think the most obvious example of um, the divide happening, and it might be a bit controversial to say, but I think Parity moving moving on uh, from from Ethereum and focusing a lot of their time on Polkadot, which I consider like, I mean, people will disagree with me on this, but I consider it a competitor to Ethereum and kind of like it's got a lot of the same architecture as Ethereum 2.0 as well. So, you know, I think that's where the most obvious divide is happening uh, right now. And I think that puts a splinter in things in terms of friendships as well, because uh, traditionally a lot of the people that, Parity have been friends with a lot of the other Ethereum community members and things like that. So I think that's where it's definitely uh, showing the most. Do you think that one of the reasons that there are so many E2.0 developers is, I pointed this out last year, where like, you know, the amount of control that Parity had over the Ethereum 2.0 roadmap was a little bit scary, where like, it seemed to me what, if they, not saying that this is what happened, but if you're going to take a really cynical point of view, uh, what you would do, it, you know, it seems what Parity would want to do is stall and like grind their feet until they could get Polkadot out the door and make sure it gets out the door before ETH 2.0. When I was at Scaling Ethereum uh, this a uh, couple of m months ago in Toronto, it seemed that like, from what I could tell, the Ethereum 2.0 road like design and the Polkadot design are quickly becoming very, very, very overlapping. So I guess this is a general question about the uh, community as a whole, like, how cynical do you think we should be approaching? Like, you know, for example, Amin, he likes to take a very, very cynical approach and assume everyone has like the worst intentions. Or should we be a little bit more kind of, for, not forgiving, but more open to like, you know, you know what I mean? A little bit not, not as cynical when we approach and assume people maybe have better intentions than they... Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, it's something Anthony and I discuss a lot. I think you know, in reality, I think in general, people aren't skeptical enough. And the reason is there's a lot of money at stake here, right? And when you involve money and these teams in reality are going to want to build out user base and, you know, grow their chain and they get bigger returns. When you have that, people are going to be playing not nice all the time, right? And, you know, I don't want to call out specific people or groups, but, you know, the, the biggest uh, issue that I think Ethereum had with the Polkadot team is, like Anthony said, Parity, you know, they've done a lot of great work for Ethereum for years. They still have the top second or maybe even the top client this day over Geth. Um, so they're very ingrained in the community. So it's hard to, like, know, you know, like you said, where they may be intentionally stalling the 2.0 spec. Who knows, right? But I do think we need to be a tiny bit more cautious than people. A lot of people, I think, just like to assume that everyone's playing nice. In reality, when money's involved, that just isn't the case, right? So I think it's fair at times to question. I don't think it's good to ever get personal or you know attack people and <laughs> certain people go about it differently. But it seems to me, you know, we went through a weird transition of you know, Reddit trying to oust admins that were involved in parody from the Ethereum subreddits. And I think we've moved on a little bit and it seems like the projects have kind of finally split besides parody, obviously having uh, an ETH client and, you know, building out an ETH2 client as well. But I, to be honest, I haven't seen much updates from them on the ETH2 side recently. What would you say is the most dangerous faction within the ethereum community <laughs> that's a very controversial question um, so we like to do on this podcast yes yes uh i i think it's definitely with from within uh for sure it, it'd have to be uh like i mean calling out an entire organization is a bit <laughs> is a bit hard but definitely parody uh from what i've seen their behavior um, you know, with, within Ethereum, if you really do dig into the weeds, uh, it doesn't seem they have Ethereum, Ethereum's best intentions at heart anymore. Uh, as Eric said, they've done a lot of good work in the past for Ethereum and they still contribute to Ethereum to some extent. But, you know, I, I think most of their time is now focused on Polkadot. And you did say that 
Uh, a lot of the design of uh, designs of both the systems of Ethereum 2.0 and Polkadot do overlap a lot, uh, especially you know if you really dig into the designs, you can see it uh, quite obviously. Uh, so yeah, I do think they may have been dragging their feet a little bit as well, um, and that's you know obviously caused. I think the Ethereum Foundation uh, realized this, and a lot of a lot of people working on ETH 2.0 realized this and realized that this needed to be more decentralized of a development process. So that's why we have so many independent teams now. I think as well building out clients, uh, you know, as Eric said, I haven't actually seen much from Parity on the ETH 2.0 side. Uh, I, I, th I know that they were building um, a Shasper client. They they called it Shasper was, I guess, the original name for Ethereum 2.0 before we kind of like changed it from that because no one really liked that name. But um, they were definitely building that using their new Substrate uh, developer tooling or, or, or platform. But yeah, so I think it definitely comes with within, uh, from within and there are there are individuals and groups that may be trying to kind of like subvert uh, uh, like different Ethereum people and, and bring them over to their chain and say, you know, the grass is greener over here, come here, you'll get paid more or, you know, you can do more here, you're less restricted and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I think the Ethereum community has traditionally been uh, very open, very nice, you know, very welcoming and everything. But I think at this point in time, we kind of need to keep that, but also be a lot more cautious about who we let into like the deep uh, spaces of Ethereum and who we let influence certain decisions, like whether that be politically or technically and things like that. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's a, there's obviously core groups of people that people look up to and, uh, as a signal uh, and things like that. So I think we need to be really cautious about who we give that kind of political power to. Since Ethereum 2.0 and Polkadot are so, are so similar and they do overlap quite a bit, I mean, Ultimately, it would be ideal if those two communities were to some some way rekindle and become one community because it would just make the entire ecosystem stronger. We would be in a much better situation if we had one strong Web3 slash Ethereum community rather than two different fragmented communities in the long term, I think. Where do you think the barriers are for that to happen? Do you think it's already too late? Or do you think people could mend things or certain sub factions of those communities could mend things in a way that would make that possible. Yeah, I mean, I guess first you'd have to ask Gavin Wood, right? He's the one that decided to split them. But, uh, you know, I, I think, to be honest, I don't see it rejoining. I, I think the communities could rejoin. I mean, for example, in Berlin, like Web3 has their Web3 Summit, then there's DAPCON, then there's ETH Berlin, and like a lot of people are going to all those events, right? So Both of those are overlapping, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, Yeah. So I think like the communities still cross. I, I know there's people interested in both. Like Anthony's definitely interested in both. He's open about that and, you know, it, it wants to see Polkadot succeed as well. But I think in reality, the values have split a little bit, right? So Polkadot seems to be focusing more on the on-chain governance aspect and they're not as, you know, interested in the base asset gaining a monetary premium, which, you know, I think the Ethereum community has started to, to grow up to. And the Ethereum community isn't that big on on-chain government governance and doesn't see it as a feature, right? So these are kind of two very important community values that I think have essentially split. And, you know, I don't know Gavin, I don't know why he decided to leave Ethereum and start Polkadot, but I think he has more of this vision of this Web3 world where people on-chain are governing this system. And I, I just don't think that's a fit for Ethereum right now. So I guess I'll follow on from that as well and say, I think we should address the elephant in the room when talking about parity, right? They have a lot of money locked on Ethereum <laughs> right now, um, locked in that multi-sig, uh, not just them. There's a, there's a few other parties as well that have a lot of money locked. And I think that was the pivotal moment where the split really happened was when the Ethereum community basically said like a strong, no, we're not going to unlock these funds essentially. Uh, and I think that, the, um, you know, a lot of uh, people, especially like obviously those affected were like, well, you did this for the DAO. Uh, why won't you do this for us sort of thing? And I think that the Ethereum community has, um, has definitely proved itself in that the DAO was like a one-time thing up until this point. It wasn't a precedent where, you know, if there's a large hack, we'll, you know, reverse that transaction or, or alter the state or anything like that, or, or do whatever's necessary to get those funds back. So I think that was when I started noticing a lot more hostility happen between the maybe the two communities. Do you think that was a, a bad decision in hindsight? And looking back on that, do you think the community could have just said, sure, let's reverse that and have the funds go back? No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think it was a bad decision because I think the damage of reversing that would be would pay uh, would be a lot worse in the long term than uh, the short term pain of losing a, a really great team, like a great engineering team, a great core team to Ethereum. But I, uh, but definitely they were already working on Polkadot, right? So 
I don't think that would have made a positive difference giving the, the money back. I think it would have been very negative over the long term. Uh, we, we're still reeling from the Dow, right? So just doing another one of those, I mean, people call them bailouts, people call them, you know, rescue, people call it censorship, whatever you want to call it, doing another one of those would uh, definitely be a, a long term negative impact on Ethereum. And what about Vitalik? Where do you see his role currently and going forward? Yeah, he seems to be taking just a lead researcher role at this point. I mean, he has stepped back from, he's very rarely seen on core dev calls. He's He wasn't involved in any of the decisions like to lower block rewards from three to two last year. Um, but he's very active on the ETH researcher forum on GitHub and kind of like the top person as far as ETH2 research goes, right? Him, Danny Ryan, Justin Drake, everyone there doing good work. But he definitely seems to have taken a step back from the, I guess I'll put it, governance side of things. I mean, in 2014, 2015, 16, you know, what Vitalik said on core dev calls probably went, right? And I think he probably realized that and said, we need to grow up as a community. I'm going to take a step back. And it seems like to be honest, I think he just enjoys the research side more in general too. So um, just kind of what he's settled into now. Yeah, I think that makes sense for him now that the community is is uh, what it is and, and as, as large and diverse as it is, uh, for him to take a step back and, and be in more of that research role uh, makes more sense maybe for him and, and also for the state of the project in general. Yeah, he's definitely taken, uh, like as Eric said, uh, purposely taken a, a step back uh, within the Ethereum community because he realized he did have this kind of like centralizing influence, if you want to call it that, where people would look to him and and, and wait for his answer sort of thing uh, and say, oh, he's, you know, he's Vitalik on, on my side or is he on my side, blah, blah, blah. And then people would kind of rally around that as like this this beacon, I, I guess you could call it, uh, which I think was definitely unhealthy. Uh, and I'm really like obviously happy that Vitalik realized that. But I think that there's a distinction to be made between centralization of development and centralization of like decision making, uh, you know, on, on chain and things like that. And and things like, you know, the parity uh, frozen funds, for instance, and, and, and things like that. So I think at the moment, obviously, ETH2 is, is in centralized development because the network's not live. Uh, the research is pretty much centralized around a core group of people that are Work well employed by the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, you know, Eric mentioned some of them, uh, but there's also research going on now in other areas such as Consensus. They have their Quilt team working on Phase Two uh, research for ETH2. We have the nine independent developer teams as well, the the client implementers and things like that. And so I think Vitalik's just fallen into the background where he like he he commonly just posts things on ETH research that he's come up with because he he obviously loves doing the research stuff and he puts it out there and then people will literally read it think, oh, that's cool, I'll build that, and then go ahead and build it, right? Uh, I don't think I've seen Vitalik weigh in on any decisions or anything, like major decisions uh, with regards to ETH1. He's, he's, he seems squarely focused on ETH2, and he's letting you know the community basically steward ETH1. And I don't think that if he came back and said something like, oh, we should you know save the, the parity funds, I don't think the community would go with him on that at all, uh, to be honest. Let's talk about security. You know, dApps are pretty unique because unlike other types of software, they can hold astronomical amounts of value. That's why getting systems audited, creating robust security processes, and fostering a culture of security in your organization is so important. And to do this, you should only trust experts with real security expertise. There are a lot of security firms in the blockchain space, but few have the experience and track record of Trail of Bits. And they've been in business since 2012, long before things like the DAO hack were even imaginable. Trail of Bits works with your team to audit every aspect of your project. And smart contract code is just the beginning. They'll help you implement best practices around things like DevOps, key storage, and user-facing applications. And once your software has been rigorously tested and reviewed by Trail of Bits, they'll provide the tools you need to make sure that your code remains safe over every new commit. They can even put a software security expert at your team's disposal who will give you advice and answer your questions when you need them. It's like having your own security engineer on staff. But don't take my word for it. Go to their publications repo on GitHub to read their papers, presentations, and security reviews. It's no wonder teams like Parity, Status, New Cipher, and organizations like Facebook and DARPA trust Trail of Bits for their security audits. To learn more, go to trailofbits.com. And if you decide to reach out, make sure you let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. We'd like to thank Trail of Bits for their support. One question I actually want to I wanted to ask a little from a little bit earlier, but uh, was about the skepticism in the space. Do you think that 
there's an extent where we might be taking it a bit too far. So there was this um, a, the Coin Jazeera article a few a few weeks ago, one of the ones about like uh, polka dot and stuff. And you know, I know Coin Jazeera is supposed to be like a satire art, uh, magazine and stuff, but you know, they they called Lane like a sleeper agent for polka dot. And do you think that there's a I don't know. I feel that there might be almost a little bit of Trotskyism uh, going on, where it's like, oh, anyone who like disagrees with the the mainstay of what the community says is like, oh, they're clearly working for the enemy or something like that. And do you think that might get dangerous at a point where it's like, for example, you know, I, I'll admit I felt this sometimes myself, where like, yes, I work on Cosmos, but there's a lot of I, I worked on Ethereum before I even started working on Cosmos, and there's a lot of times where I'd like, you know, I propose stuff where I'm like, oh. I think this would be a way to legitimately improve Ethereum. And then people's direct response is, oh, you, you know, you're doing it to undermine Ethereum in order to help Cosmos. And do you think that can be a little bit dangerous and maybe disincentivize people from even wanting to contribute? Yeah, I think that it definitely, uh, you know, it can play out like that where, uh, and I've seen this happen myself for sure. Uh, I think, uh, you know, if we, if I don't want to single anyone out, but I mean, Lane's been a, a pretty big topic lately in the Ethereum community, right? He's taking the other side of basically every mainstay, as you say, like Ethereum narrative and, and what the Ethereum community rallies behind and everything like that. But I think in the case of Lane, he is actually going to, uh, seems to be going to work for something outside of the Ethereum community, right? And, you know, it's kind of like the timing is, is curious, right? When you look at it, it was something like that, where he, basically is going to work for another project, right? And now he's all of a sudden saying all these negative things about Ethereum. Whereas while he was working with it, he may have taken, you know, the contrarian side uh, sometimes, but he never really uh, did it as he does now. So I think that the timing is what you need to, to look at uh, and things like that. But I mean, that's just one individual, right? I think most people don't operate like that. I don't think most people have the capacity to do that or want to do that. Like, it's kind of like, when you really think about it, it's kind of like a shitty thing to do. So I think that uh, in, you know, in, in your case, for example, I, I don't think like personally that you're trying to undermine Ethereum at all. I just think that you have different views about how something should be built. And that's why you, you know, you're building on Cosmos and things like that. And, and most people are probably like that, right? Even the people working at, at Parity, pretty much like all of them, I would say, don't have you know, bad intentions or want to cause harm to Ethereum. But at the end of the day, if you're building a platform that you want people to use, like as people say, it's not a zero sum game and all these sorts of things, but it does have a, a, a distribution where most of uh, the people will use one particular network, right? So we, we've already seen this play out where Ethereum, even though it has so many competitors, is still the dominant platform by far. Like EOS raised $4 billion, Block One raised $4 billion for EOS, right? And from what I've seen, they aren't gaining much traction, uh, you know, even though they have all this money, right? Uh, any any of the other competitors uh, don't seem to be gaining much traction. Not to say they won't in the future, but I think at this point, you know, if you're standing up something, uh, another chain or something, then it it definitely is a competitor, whether you know the, the people standing it up want it to be or not. You know, th there might be an interoperable future uh, where you know chains talk to each other and things like that. But in terms of like where the most users go and where like a kind of like monetary premium accrues to the the base asset and things like that. It definitely follows uh, that it's like a, a, I guess, a winner take most uh, kind of uh, kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things too. I think depending on the market cycle, this stuff's amplified a lot. So um, we saw the most infighting in the community when price was tanking, which uh, it kind of all stemmed out of the funding debate, right? So the EF's treasury was drying up a bit at eighty dollars, and everyone was saying, "How are we going to fund all this work?" You know, now that we're we've bounced back up to whatever two hundred or so, like that treasury is now inflated back up a little bit, and those debates have settled down a tiny bit. But, you know, also I think in general, social media amplifies it too. So like you actually go to an Ethereum conference or meetup, everyone's getting along and, you know, everyone's there from all these different teams. And I think just social media plays, plays a role in it too. Anthony, you mentioned this like monetary premium and you think that that's like kind of one of the more important things uh, that th these chains are competing on. Could you explain to me like why do you think that, first of all, is the success of Ethereum dependent on the ETH asset kind of, you know, appreciating in value? And yeah, how linked are these two things? I think during the phase that we're in right now, where it's really early and speculation is pretty much like most of what people use these networks for, I think it's extremely important. I don't think Bitcoin would be anywhere where it is today if the price didn't go up, like no one would be nearly as interested. Uh, if you look at kind of like Bitcoin as the shining example of why people are involved, you know, people will freely admit that they're involved because they want Bitcoin to go up, right? And everything they do is to make Bitcoin uh, go up and, 
you know, educating more users means more people buy Bitcoin, which, which means it goes up, uh, like theoretically, right? And I think that's what most of the people have been rallying around at this point. Um, it definitely exists in Ethereum as well. People obviously buy Ether because they want to see Ether appreciate. Like, I mean, you can buy Ether, a little bit of Ether, so you have to use it for gas and things like that to use the network. But mo- like, there's a massive premium there. Like, no one's really buying Ether for gas unless they have to. They're not buying it and being like, okay, I'm going to stockpile this so I can use the Ethereum network in the future. No, they're buying it with the hopes bec- of it appreciating. So I think it plays a massively important role in a crypto network, um, just getting people involved. Like at the end of the day, uh, you know, even in the future when we evolve past this, people are going to buy these assets so that they can make money. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, we've already seen the the biggest use cases on Ethereum being DeFi, which is all uh, pretty much all speculation. I mean, DAI is used in some capacity, you know, for people to hold US dollars in other countries. Like I know something like Argentina, uh, there's a few people there that use DAI uh, instead of like, so they can get exposure to the US dollar, but in a kind of censorship resistant way and things like that. But uh, I think that, you know, an appreciating asset prices, as Eric mentioned, is just great for like, the overall uh, community, the morale, the kind of network health and things like that. It definitely, uh, it obviously plays a, a massive role in the security of the network, uh, you know, especially under uh, proof of stake, where uh, obviously the higher the price of the asset is, the more it would cost to uh, attack the network and things like that. So, uh, you know, I, I've put out a few tweets around this where I, uh, where I say that, you know, a higher ETH price brings in the kind of legitimacy to the platform. So if you're like number, so Ethereum being like number two to Bitcoin and being the number one smart contract platform means that most people will default to just building on Ethereum because of that, right? Uh, and, and and it works as like a signal to uh, the community that Ethereum is going to be around for a long time because there's a lot of money invested and things like that. So there's all these kind of second order effects that happen from attaining a kind of like monetary premium and becoming like the store of value uh, not to mention all of the social stuff that happens around people getting like really involved with the Ethereum community simply because they hold Ether. Like, I mean, that's the reason why both Eric and I, you know, got pretty heavily involved as well. Like we obviously own Ether and, 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 and we'd like to see it appreciate in the future. Uh, so we take that as a, as a, as one motivation to build things like Ether and to keep contributing to the community. So I think that that's a massive driver and, you know, taking the flip side to that and going back to, I think like what Lane was talking about on Twitter recently, where, he feels that people coming into Ethereum later are getting like a way smaller share of the of the pie, right? Because Ethereum launched in uh, 2015, they had the ICO in 2014, where the public ICO like obviously was very public. It was available to everyone to participate in, but someone like me who only got in later didn't get to actually participate in that ICO. And, you know, depending on when you bought ETH, you've bought it at like X times amount as to who bought it at ICO, right? But I don't think that that's something that these networks can kind of like fix. No one, you know, stopped anyone from buying ether at these low prices it was just like an awareness thing at the end of the day so i i definitely think that that you know can cause some disenfranchisement in the community and things like that but i don't think it's going to be like a a massive barrier to uh to entry into different communities yeah and i I think on that too i mean we're obviously both big believers in DeFi, right and think you know, ideally this be, could become the new global financial system, right? And to do that, you need Ether, which is basically the reserve asset of this new global economy one day, ideally. Um, you need it to have value because it's securing the it's securing DAI, right? DAI is essentially stable ETH, and you need ETH to be collateral for everything that's kind of happening in the DeFi space. So, you know, and doing that, and if that's the vision you believe in for the future on Ethereum, um, you know, DeFi continue to grow and ideally kind of usurping the traditional finance system, um, you need Ether to have value. And especially because you can even get more basic than that. If we're tokenizing real world assets someday, there's trillions in value secured on the chain. You know, the chain can't be cheap to attack because no one's going to want to secure all this value on a chain that could be easily 51% attacked because the underlying asset is is cheap, right? So I think those all together kind of, you know, that's at least why I believe Ethereum needs to, or Ether needs to develop this monetary premium. So I think DAI is actually a great example of one of my concerns with the Ethereum model. And maybe, you know, I, I meant to ask this to Rune on our MakerDAO episode like last week, but we, 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 there was so much interesting stuff going on DAI, we didn't even have time to get to that. But here's the, uh, my, my question. I don't think DAI gets any security from Ethereum because what's happening here is you have two different tokens. One that's being used to secure the operational side of the network, which is ETH, and then one that's being used to secure the governance of the network, which is the MKR token. And what you would do if you wanted to attack the system 
is you'd attack the lower value system, the lower price asset, which is the MKR. You'd go buy it, control and share of MKR and like just crash the, the, the functionality of DAI. So in this world, like you, you get the lower of the two security, but you're paying for the higher of the two security. So you're getting MKR security, but you're, the, the DAI holders are paying for ETH security. Wouldn't it make sense to me, at least in this case, for MKR to kind of break off into its own chain in which the MKR acts as a staking token for that system? I think this acts true for many applications as well. Like, it, I think it's true for REP and Augur. I think it's true for the 0x token. I think it's true for a lot of applications. So what are your thoughts on this, where eventually like the individual operational tokens of different applications will eventually just want to break off into their own chains? I think um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, I think, definitely. Uh, in terms of like, I know this is like the Cosmos model, right? Uh, where things break off into their own like little universes and, and then connect to like a, a central hub and things like that. But I think that the maker system, obviously, uh, I think does inherit the security uh, from Ethereum. So say like maker was to break off into its own chain, right? And uh, the MKR token's worth, I think, 700 million uh, market cap at the moment, uh, something like that. So that network would be essentially uh, worth $700 million worth of security, if you want to look at it that way, uh, or something like that. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about the technicals of how it works in Cosmos and, and maybe Polkadot later on about like shared security and things like that. Uh, but as far as I know, in Cosmos, it's like you are responsible for the security of your own kind of like uh, chain, essentially. And then you can plug in and interoperate with other chains if you want to. So I think the maker system itself definitely benefits from the fact that Ethereum is, is you know, much higher market cap. So there's much higher implied security from that as well. Uh, whereas, you know, being its own chain, the, the security would obviously be lowered uh, and things like that. But my point is, if you want to attack the MKR system, if you want to destroy DAI, I don't need to attack the chain. I just need to attack the MKR governance. Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, that's definitely, uh, definitely a risk there. But I think that moving to, I guess, the own your own chain, it would kind of compound these things where you could uh, attack both. You know, obviously the governance, and that would in, uh, that would just destroy the chain it, it itself, right? So you'd be doing, you'd be like killing two birds with one stone. Whereas uh, Maker being on Ethereum, like you can attack the Maker system, uh, right? But I mean. It depends like how big Maker is. I mean, it's, it's pretty big at the moment and DAI is a pretty big part of Ethereum where it will have a cascading effects on the rest of the Ethereum network. But I think that even if Maker was its own system that kind of plugged into Ethereum and DAI was still used as it is today, it would still have those effects. Uh, so I guess I can still I can still see benefits to both ways of doing it where Maker being its own system means that if it gets destroyed, it's like concentrated there. But I still think it has those on-flow effects. Whereas if DAI is still used in the same capacity, it would still have the same effect on it. On Ethereum, where uh, all, all the apps that rely on Dai would uh, kind of go down with it, basically. Yeah, I, and I think this is almost more of a governance question too, which I'm not personally a fan of much uh, app or on-chain governance. But you know, this is more around yeah the cost to attack a governance system, and it gets a little tricky with maker because they technically have a fail safe switch, and you know they have this scientific governance, which technically you know it's not totally up to the coin voters because they can fail switch it at the at the end there and kind of settle the entire system so but yeah no I, I think an important question definitely is like how cheap is it to attack some of these you know applications that have a token voting system right and there's a lot of them out there zero x argon maker you know maker's not the only one right and for some of these coins it's it's very cheap to attack those systems so i guess you know the value of what you capture after the attack has to be there but it, it's an interesting question so i'd like to come back to this idea of ether having value and try to to unpack that a little bit so if we look at ether and the value that it has today and so the market cap it is derived of two things primarily. So one is the demand for gas, and the other is the expectation that Ether will someday power the global financial system and the value that is derived from that. At the moment, I would say that there is a huge premium on Ether because I don't think the demand for gas gives Ether the value that it has at the moment. And then all of the overhead there is speculation on what the future Ether platform could provide in terms of actual value. So if, if we agree on that, then wouldn't it be the best course for the community to, rather than focus on building more applications, more tooling, 
DAOs, et cetera, which seems to be the focus now, wouldn't it be better for the community to be really focusing on the use cases and bringing those real world assets into Ether, creating the bridges that allows real financial assets, tangible assets, physical assets from the traditional financial system into Ethereum so that we can ha- actually have real assets backing it and Ether having like actual value rather than the speculative value. Yeah, I guess to your first point, I I don't fully agree. Well, I agree to an extent, but I would push back and say you can say the exact same thing for Bitcoin. Um, you need Bitcoin for fees on the Bitcoin network. Other than that, it's entirely speculative. Um, I guess Bitcoin holders would argue that it's sound money um, and it's a store of value, right? So I think that's where we're going in the Ethereum community with you know this store of value, Ether as money, Ether as a reserve currency for the global financial system someday, you know, that's more of where the value is being derived from now, not just gas payments. Because if you believe that, you know, the value would just be derived from gas, like you said, we're way off from that. But the exact same thing can be said for Bitcoin too, right? So, you know, right now the issuance on both the Ethereum and Bitcoin networks are right around four to four and a half percent. So there's really not much different in the asset underlying it other than just the narratives between the two communities. But, you know, I fully agree with you. I think beyond this just like memeing of sound money and store value, we need to actually bring use cases to the chain. And in the long run, that's going to drive adoption and usage and people are going to want to buy it and speculate on it and use it as gas, right? And I, I do think that that's why the community is building out more and more on the DeFi space, right? If you, you know, we're seeing all these narratives around like Argentina and Venezuela and people are saying, you know, oh, buy Bitcoin. Well, in reality, most of the people who actually live in those countries are saying they'd prefer to buy the US dollar or die, right? If they were on a, on a crypto network because they want stability. So things like DeFi are starting to actually do that. Um, and I think the narrative of kind of be your own bank on Ethereum where you can, you know, you can have your digital asset and actually put it to use for you. You can earn interest on compound. You can invest with it in a, a set and have that set automatically rebalance across different investment types for you. You know, I, I think that's a strong vision that is slowly being built out on the Ethereum chain right now. Yeah. I mean, that's one application. So for example, you, you mentioned Argentina and having a stable cryptocurrency that you can use there in the form of DAI is probably extremely valuable for a lot of people, but it still doesn't give any more value to the underlying asset, which is Ether. It gives it gives value to this derivative asset on top of Ether, but Ether itself as sound money, you know, if we take like the Bitcoin narrative, sound money, uh, cheap transactions, borderless payments, etc. If, if DAI is the currency that people are using, Ether will never have that function. And so where does the value of Ether then derive, get derived from if all of the value is being created in the layers on top and essentially it's just a house of cards if the value of Ether starts to drop and people start leaving the platform, all this other stuff tumbles along with it. Yeah, so I think uh, I'll, um, I'll circle back to a post that I wrote uh, earlier this year called Why Ether is Valuable. Now, your criticisms or I guess like points uh, about, uh, you know, Ether itself and, um, you know, what uh, what will drive value to Ether. Just, just to be fair, the, I, I have this points or criticisms or observations for every cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin, Cosmos, whatever. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I definitely think that that rings true yeah, for, for definitely everything. And as I, as I mentioned previously, speculation is like the, the main driver here of a lot of this value uh, for sure. But I guess like what I tried to do in my blog post, uh, like the YA3 val- has value or is valuable blog post uh, was outline like what use cases Ethereum is kind of fitting today. Uh, so if we actually look at, you know, go back a little bit and look at the history in 2017, Ether was used for the ICO boom. And I think that's what drove a lot of its value. It became a kind of like, uh, you know, snowball effect where people would buy Ether to contribute to this ICO and then they would sell their tokens, uh, whether they profited or not from it, back into Ether and then put that additional Ether back into other ICOs. Now, you know, they could have sold those tokens for US dollars or, or Bitcoin, but that, uh, I think a lot of them sold it for Ether because they expected that they'd just recycle it back into another ICO using Ether and then, you know, have those gains again. So I think that's what happened in the second half of 2017, especially when basically you know, every ICO was returning these these, these insane gains to, to a lot of people. Uh, so that's what drove most of the value there. And I think that's what actually drove a lot of value to Bitcoin itself too, like on flow effect to Bitcoin. I think that's why Bitcoin got to 20K and things like that. And then obviously we had the hangover period during 2018 where both of the assets crashed a lot. I think ETH kind of led the crash there and pulled Bitcoin down with it. Uh, you know, ETH obviously fell more than Bitcoin 
has and is still uh, a lot lower than, than Bitcoin as well. Uh, and then I think since then, the Ethereum community has uh, taken a look at why Ether is valuable. So what will drive more value to Ether outside of its use cases as, as being used as money? Uh, like I know that's become a bit of a meme at the moment, it, you know, is ETH money or isn't it? It definitely has been used as money in limited capacities, uh, not enough to justify the, 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 the market cap of Ether as it currently stands. And then a lot of people are saying, like you are, that if DAI fills a lot of these use cases, which DAI is actually a lot better for, I think, uh, filling a lot of these use cases, whether it's as money or, or you know, any type of payment is basically going to be uh, better done in DAI because it's, it's, it's stable uh, relative to the US dollar. I think that the value of Ether is going to have to come from different things. So uh, there's been a lot of a, a thinking being evolved around this, especially from uh, someone that I follow quite closely. Uh, his name is Ryan Sean Adams. Uh, I think a lot of people would have seen him on Twitter. He basically is, uh, I think, the the leader in making the case for for why Ether should have value and you know where that value is going to be derived from. Uh, he recently went on a, a podcast called POV Crypto with um, David Hoffman and his co-host there, uh, Christian explaining that Ether has become this kind of triple point asset or will become this triple point asset where it basically serves three different functions as one asset. Uh, so he outlines these functions as Ether as a capital asset. So it produces income for the holders, uh, where whether it's being it's lending out Ether or using it in staking in the future, where you'll get a return uh, on staking it. Uh, Ether as a consumable asset. So it's needed for all kind of financial transactions on Ethereum uh, in the form of gas, of course. And in the future, we may have state rent, which is basically paying to uh, use the Ethereum network, paying a little bit of uh, rent to use the Ethereum network if you've deployed a contract or things like that, uh, so that the state doesn't bloat out. Uh, it gets a bit technical. That may or may not happen, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then with the gas fees, we may have um, a, a new uh, fee market on Ethereum in the form of EIP-1559, which uh, Eric co-authored as well. If you go check that out, it basically describes this thing of burning ETH, so making it, uh, I guess, a more scarce asset in that way. And then he uh, describes Ether as a store of value asset, so similar to Bitcoin in the sense that it's, it can be a store of value, but it also has a use within the Ethereum network as a, um, a required capital for things like open finance. So, I mean, an interesting stat that I looked at around Ether was that um, Ether being so valuable right now can allow for these other platforms to get bigger and uh, within DeFi. So something like Maker, right, has... I think it's like 2% of all ETH locked up in, in Maker. It's probably less than that now. In, in all of DeFi, it's about $450 million or, or 2%-ish of, of all ETH. Uh, so if you were to do that on something like uh, like Tezos, for example, the same amount of dollar ma uh, value would require you to lock up 50% of all uh, XZT in DeFi to do that. So you know, Ether being more valuable allows it to be more liquid and, and, and um, allows it to do a lot more things within the Ethereum network without you know having to put up 50% of the supply, for example, which would be extremely hard to, to get everyone rallying around that. So yeah, there's all these different things that can drive value to the to Ether itself uh, in terms of core uses. But I think for the foreseeable future, and I'm talking decades here, it's going to be driven mainly by speculation, just as uh, pretty much every other network is. And uh, as I've mentioned previously, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that has you know massive second order effects that, uh, that compound and, and create these other use cases. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. I don't think anybody would sit, argue that like today, uh, you know, Ether is money across the world and, and all of its value is derived from usage, right? We'd be kidding ourselves in, in saying that. I think it's more about setting this up for the future, right? Like something can't just become money and have a monetary premium overnight. So how do you assure that, you know, this can happen in the future? And I think building out the DeFi infrastructure, making sure issuance is low, and Anthony mentioned staking, like that's a big component of this too, right? You're going to be able to stake your capital and earn an interest return on it. So all of these things just coming together over the years, I think that's your you know monetary premium and we're just basically in the uh i guess the birthing stage of of how we get there when it comes to the monetary premium i feel like one of the things that a lot of people have been doing on twitter lately you guys uh as well but you know other people as well is i feel there's just been a lot of like critiquing of bitcoin going on just like you know but i feel like twitter feed is just like constantly just people just shitting on bitcoin and to what extent do you think this is like beneficial to the system as a whole, or do you think it might drive people away? Like, you know, it, it seems that like even Vitalik, one of the reasons he left the Bitcoin community and like and created Ethereum was he got kind of turned away from the maximalism that was happening in the Bitcoin community. And I don't know, I just feel over the course of the last year that I, I, I see like similar trends of maximalism reappearing in the Ethereum community. 
And do you think this is dangerous for the for the community? Well, I guess first, I think the term maximalist has become very watered down these days. I mean, it's basically turned into uh, you're a fan of it and then you're, you're a maximalist all of a sudden. Um, I guess still the core reason Vitalik actually left is he wanted to program on top of Bitcoin, right? So um, I think it's definitely important to keep that perspective. But, you know, I, I think Bitcoin gets a free pass in a lot of things. And I think it potentially upsets people in other communities, including the Ethereum community. I mean, you know, the same hard questions aren't asked of Bitcoin that are asked of of different um, commodity or currencies that are out there, right? And one of the big ones is Bitcoin essentially has derived most of its value out of this, what I say is a meme of a 21 million Bitcoin cap, right? There is a lot of study out there that says that that's not going to be sustainable, right? How are you going to pay miners if if this is the case? And the answer that is given back a lot is, oh, well, every halvening price goes up double. So by the time we get to there, we'll be able to just pay it through fees. That's not a very good security model in my mind, right? So at the end of the day, I think there's just differences in the community and, you know, the Bitcoin community is much larger. Like if Anthony and I had our Twitters and we were Bitcoin people, we would have five to 10 times the amount of followers that we have. So their voices are just louder. Most of the, um, what I would say, FUD or misinformation about Ethereum that we see at ETHUB comes from the Bitcoin community. So it's more of a defensive position in all honesty. And, you know, I, I think... I think it's okay to have people that are, you know, advocates and fans of a crypto. And, you know, I don't think Anthony and I are as big Ether maximalists as people think we are. <laughs> um, you know, I started in Bitcoin. I actually still don't mind Bitcoin. I just think they get some free passes on some big topics. And, you know, we've we've owned different coins over time. And, you know, I think we're both open to the fact that maybe Ethereum doesn't win this thing, right? But at the end of the day, I think you're just going to get that when people are dedicating a lot of time and passion and potentially money to, right? I think to some extent that's true. And I, I do agree that a lot of the people who are quote unquote Bitcoin maximalists uh, attract huge following. So if one you know wants to build their personal branding, attaching themselves to um, some maximalism ideas is probably a, a good way to do it. Although um, I don't know how genuine it is uh, to do that. So I, I'd like to talk to you, Eric, about this spreadsheet you re- recently compiled and published with all the projects basically and how uh, they're being funded through the different forms of community funding uh, that exists. So whether it's the Ethereum Foundation or, uh, you know, even like the Moloch DAO or the Aragon Fund or some of the different uh, community funds that projects have. Why did you do this? And what kind of trends did you observe in this um, from, from this analysis? Yeah, so this kind of all stemmed from this funding debate, which we referenced earlier. And the Ethereum community is trying to find its way of how to fund important work outside of the Ethereum Foundation, right? Like Ethereum Foundation is not going to be around forever. Eventually, they're going to run out of funds. They're not a for-profit business. They just give funds out. So that that's leaking slowly and slowly. So we need to find better ways to fund the community. And, you know, I'm personally a part of Moloch DAO and Metacartel DAO, which are DAOs that try to give money out to um, Ethereum projects. And, you know, there were a lot of this debate around I think the EF gets a lot of unfair flack. I actually think they're doing a pretty good job at giving out funds. And, you know, there was debates around block rewards, which is something, you know, I disagree with. So the community was like trying to justify what teams deserve more money. And it was just asking, like, does anybody have, has anybody actually put together like a spreadsheet of what teams need money, how much they have and why they need more? And the answer was just no. People were like, oh, we should fund someone to do this. And I just got frustrated and spent four hours and I just collected all the grants that have ever been given out on Ethereum and I just built it myself. So basically how it works is um, I put the teams and projects on there. I think there's like 105 of them or so. And then where they got their money and how much they've raised. Um, You know, the trends would be the EF has clearly given out the most amount of money. The highest investment so far is definitely around ETH2. And the second most would be around layer two scaling solutions most of the stuff kind of pales in comparison to those two. So, you know, one of the biggest things that we're seeing is this pop-up of, you know, outside of the EF, like community grants. So like Aragon has one, Gnosis has one, there's the ECF, there's Gitcoin grants. And then really the emergence of DAOs, you know, I think Anthony said the other day, 2019 has kind of become the year of the DAO. So the community is trying to find ways to, you know, coordinate capital, which seems to be that we can do this through 
things like the Moloch DAO, where people put in funds, and then we have a very simple voting mechanism of how these funds should be spent. So, you know, I think we're getting there. I don't think the answer is block rewards. And there's been a lot of money given out over time. I mean, there's $21 million that have been given out according to the sheet over the last couple of years. So I think we need to just give it time. And I think we're finding ways um, slowly to, to fund important work. I think one of the things that stands out on that spreadsheet that, that you, you kind of see when you look at it the first time is that Polkadot actually got the five, $5 million uh, grant, which kind of ties back to our earlier discussion, but we're not going to get into that. I, I wanted to ask you, though, but in, in terms of funding, so $21 million, okay, that's, you know, some amount of money. Some might argue it's, it's not a whole lot if you look at maybe, you know, the available funding that projects could get from raising money from VCs or investors. Do you think it's better for the ecosystem to approach funding from this sort of ground up community funded grants program, DAOs, et cetera, like the ones we see today? Or do you think it would be more beneficial for projects uh, to seek uh, investor funding, VC funding, where the, the interest is perhaps more to build real world applications and consumer applications and applications for businesses where you know, investors could bring some of that experience and perhaps partnerships and um, sales approach that would lead us towards you know, what we were talking earlier, an Ethereum that is more closely connected to the real, real world and where we're building real applications. Yeah, I definitely think teams could do a better job on the VC funding side and finding ways to monetize their platform. So, you know, I'm pretty surprised to see teams haven't started offering like small subscription services and, you know, pro features and finding ways to monetize their platform. And I think especially around ETH2, I mean, you're talking about if you become a top client in ETH2, your user base is going to have hundreds of millions of dollars secured in your software, right? There's definitely ways to sell services to those people and more pro features. And you've got all this money sitting there. That's something a venture capitalist would be very interested in hearing a pitch on, right? So I'm surprised that we don't see more of it. I'm not, I'm not sure why that's the case. Um, you know, I, VCs don't have a problem throwing money at people that don't have a monetization plan, right? Like, like that's how most seed funding works. So I'm surprised it's not happening. Maybe it will over time. We recently saw like Uniswap raise, and I know Anthony's team over at SET had raised some money recently too. So I think we're seeing it happen, but it needs to happen more because the reality is we're not going to be able to fund, you know, 20, $50 million a year in, in Ethereum out of DAOs unless price goes up 10, 20 times from here, right? So it's just the reality of the situation. I mean, Moloch has like $1.5 million in it. The idea is that you give out funds and you know those funds are used to build cool things on Ethereum and then the price goes up and you have more to fund. But um, I hope that teams can find ways to find revenue in different avenues. So moving on now to Ethereum 2.0, can you tell us what is the state of Ethereum 2.0 generally and the research around that, that big project? Yeah, so I guess currently, uh, so the spec, the phase zero, uh, 2.0 phase zero beacon chain spec was frozen back at the end of June, June 30th, I think it was. So that basically means that the client teams can now build off that spec uh, without it changing every day uh, and build their implementations out and things like that. And get more testing going. So we've got a few test net clients out at the moment, uh, you know, from Prismatic Labs, from Sigma Prime. I think Status as well has their Nimbus test net client out too. So that's coming along really nicely. Uh, they're live, uh, they're, you know, they're fixing bugs, changing things every day to, to make sure it all works and, and um, you know, uh, talks to each other. Uh, and, and that's one thing that actually that the client teams are now focusing on. Uh, there was recently a workshop about it, the networking of um, ETH 2.0 and how all these different clients are going to basically talk to each other. So that's been a, a really heavy uh, focus uh, as of late, uh, and that's coming along really nicely as well. There's a really great uh, newsletter from Ben Edgington called What's New in ETH 2 uh, that, that goes out every other week that um, you can use to follow basically follow along on what's happening with ETH2 basically in the weeds. Like it's, it gets a bit technical, uh, but it'll, it'll keep you up to speed. Uh, so yeah, basically when, once that's fleshed out, I think the target date for launching that on mainnet uh, for the phase zero on mainnet is uh, early 2020. So there was a date flown around about it being January 3rd, uh, but I don't think that date's uh, you know anywhere near concrete. I think it was just like, a date given uh, on one of the calls and, and some people, including me, unfortunately, took it as like gospel. Uh, but yeah, definitely targeting, um, you know, Q1 there. 
And in terms of research into the other phases, so phase one specs come along really nicely as well. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, getting completed like really quickly actually. Uh, and then phase two uh, of Ethereum 2.0 is um, definitely in heavy research as well. And new things such as execution environments are coming out too at the moment. Uh, they're kind of playing with that and seeing how they can uh, make that work with Ethereum 2.0. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is documented on Ethub for, for those listening who don't uh, know the different phases of Ethereum and what each one means for Ethereum 2.0. So definitely go there if you wanna check out more of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, in terms of timeline, I think phase zero will definitely, uh, will hopefully go live in Q1 of next of 2020. Uh, and then from there, phase one and two can follow rather quickly. I think phase one is the um, the different shard chains going live. Uh, and then phase two would, that will be basically bringing Ethereum 2.0 to feature parity with Ethereum 1.0 in terms of what it can do, you know, in terms of having a, a virtual machine and a smart contracting platform where people can build apps and things as they can do on Ethereum 1.0 today. Wasn't there some plans to allow uh, staking at DevCon 5 this year? I think the DevCon 5 is going to be deploying the the contract to Ethereum 1.0. So basically the contract where you send your ETH in to get burned so that you're issued ETH on the ETH 2.0 beacon chain. I think there was going to be like a ceremony around that, uh, but I don't think that would include, I don't think the beacon chain, which is where you can stake your ETH is going live at DevCon. Okay, I see. What do you think about this roadmap that we're taking uh, on the ETH 2.0? I have like an alternative roadmap that I prefer, which is I think a bit more conservative, where I would prefer to see, you know, as someone who's worked on proof of stake for the last two and a half years, I don't trust proof of stake, especially not to transfer transition a $30 billion network with like so much value depending on it and applications depending on it and real world systems depending on it to an untrusted security system. And so, you know, what I would have personally preferred, and I'm, I, I submitted a talk to give this, uh, to give a talk on this at DevCon, it hasn't, I haven't heard back yet. But, you know, I, I, would, I would prefer to see a system where we test proof of stake on the shards and, you know, we keep the current 1.x chain as the beacon chain. And, you know, so at the end of the day, the fundamental root security is still the proof of work. And then we test proof of stake on shards. What do you think about, you know, why was such a radical approach taken uh, to the current E2.0 roadmap where it's like, Oh no, if you want to participate in staking, you have to participate in a one-way burn uh, from the current system to the new system. Where do you fall on this like radical versus conservative upgrade procedures? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there are definitely concerns around that, I think. Uh, you know, just a bit of history for those who don't know. Ethereum 2.0 was definitely going to be an upgrade to Ethereum 1.0. It wasn't going to be deployed as a separate chain. So it was actually going to be just deployed as a regular network upgrade or hard fork, whatever you want to call it, to the ETH 1.0 chain. Uh, and then I think about a year ago, or maybe over a year ago now, uh, those that kind of got, you know, scrapped and basically the sharding team and the proof of stake team merged together and said, we're just going to build this new system essentially. And I think that approach was done because they realized exactly what you're saying, that migrating this, you know, $30 billion network or whatever it is uh, over to this new untested system or un untried system is, is, is reckless for lack of a better word. Right. Uh, so I think that, that that's why ETH 2.0 is being stored up as a separate chain. Now, in terms of like uh, requiring people to burn their ETH to go over to the ETH 2.0 chain and be able to stake on there, I think that that's not a bad approach because what basically happens is you have these people, as I like to call them militants that come over from ETH 1.0, the ones that are going to take the most risk they're going to be on the front lines they're going to stake in eth 2.0 with ether that they know has been burned on eth 1.0 that they won't be able to access until the other phases are deployed in eth 2.0 so and then for that they'll actually get a higher reward because there will be less people staking so that the reward is actually higher so i think that doing that approach which launching a separate chain and, and requiring these militants to be, basically be the first stakers and take the most risk is probably where uh, where I see it being conservative uh, and, and things like that, while we have these two parallel chains. I mean, it does add additional complexity with how, you know, something like how exchanges are going to list these two things. Like, are they going to list the ETH1 asset as a separate to the ETH2 asset and things like that until the migration has been completed uh, altogether? Because eventually ETH1, there's a few different ways to kind of fold ETH1 into ETH2. It's either be it becomes a shard or it becomes an execution environment or or um, we just copy the state over or, you know, the technicals of it are, um, are a bit deep there. But basically, I think that's the approach that we're going with there. So uh, in terms of, you know, being conservative versus reckless, I think the current approach is quite conservative. 
you know, and I think the timelines are quite conservative as well. It's it's, it's take, definitely taken a lot longer than people would have liked to, to take, but I think that's definitely being done on purpose uh, for security reasons and, and for the overall health of, you know, both networks, essentially. Do you think there's a chance of, you know, once the splits start to happen, that there's a large segment of the community who wants to continue focusing on ETH 1.x and maybe taking, for example, a, a different roadmap or something, and that we actually see a split between the you know people who switch to the current ETH 2.0 roadmap and people who take an alternative path and continue maybe the current chain. Yes, definitely. I think that's definitely a big risk. And I actually fully expect whether someone does it to be or whether a group or someone does it to make money or do it from a different difference in vision. I definitely think that once ETH1, you know, gets folded into ETH2, uh, someone will fork the ETH1 chain and basically continue it on as it currently is. Uh, but I think that there are certain apps on Ethereum that have sway over where the community goes. So if you look at it uh, in terms of like DeFi, if all the DeFi apps moved over to ETH2.0, as it currently stands, there's not a huge reason for many users to be to, to stick to ETH1 at the end of the day. You know, most of the apps that they use have moved over, so they're just going to move with it. Uh, the, the users at the end of the day, I think, uh, have the, the most power here. Uh, you know, they, they follow wherever the, the dApps go. I mean, you could say that the dApps have the most power as well, where they can migrate over to this new chain and basically force everyone to go over there. So I think there's, yeah, there's going to be a tug of war with certain, you know, aspects of the community. There'll be people who are like ETH1 maximalists or whatever that don't want to migrate over and think that, ETH2 is, is broken and doesn't work very well. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to play out and things like that. There are definitely people that I know that I've spoken to that think ETH1 is good enough as it is, like it's fine and, and things like that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I agree or disagree with that, to be honest. Like I think it's obviously ETH1 is really, really awesome. It enables a lot of different things. But I think that that's, you know, as we, as we you know, increase usage of the platform, things like that, the scalability issues are really going to rear their head, especially in kind of like the next, if we have another bull market, right, where... Bitcoin is definitely going to suffer from the same issues it's always suffered from, uh, from 2017, where the fees are going to go really high again. I think Ethereum is going to suffer from the same issues because Ethereum doesn't scale much better than Bitcoin at the moment, uh, especially because there's more expressive apps you can use on Ethereum. So the gas, you know, you need to use more gas to interact with these apps. So it's definitely going to make the fees go up as well. So all these sorts of concerns is, is kind of like why I want to see ETH2 play out, uh, because I don't think that, um, ETH1 is enough. Like it's good, it's great. It does like what we need to do today. But in, in terms of future proofing Ethereum, it's uh, it's not enough. It definitely is enough, especially if Ethereum wants to differentiate itself from Bitcoin and not just be a platform where it supports Ether and you hold Ether and you know Ether goes up. Basically, uh, I think that Ethereum has much you know grander goals than that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, Ethereum can't. Uh, continue to grow with the current limitations on scaling. I mean, we, we saw it in, in 2017 and uh, presumably things would be much, much worse uh, if there would be another bull run or uh, another uh, rally to for ICOs or something, something like that, right? So obviously it has, to, it has to evolve. But this is a question I like to ask uh, uh, you know, people who, who are deeply involved in the Ethereum space is with Ethereum 2.0 being so far ahead in the future, the roadmap is about two to three years for, and then for things like uh, cross shard transfers, I think it's even further out. Do, do you think that Ethereum risks losing uh, talent and even just general attractiveness to other platforms that are already out there? So Cosmos is one of them and you know, Polkadot, which is I think probably coming before Ethereum 2.0. And then there's also a lot of other platforms coming from Asia and their uh, ability to attract people in those regions. You know, do you think Ethereum can continue to remain dominant in the space if it has such a, a long roadmap ahead of it to get to parity, pardon the pun, with um, any of these other platforms? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think what's going to determine that, to be honest, especially as far as developer share goes, is more on the funding side, right? I, I don't think it's necessarily roadmap related. I think a lot of these chains have very similar problems. You know, Polkadot, we can talk about it and it sounds great, but in all reality, the chain's not live, right? So um, I think who knows how long that could be for them to get up to full speed of what like an ETH2 could look like. Um, but funding is the interesting debate, right? Like these projects have bigger war chests of money to give out to developers than Ethereum does. Now, it's very interesting because Ethereum has the network effect 
it currently has the developers. I think there was a report out yesterday that Ethereum has four times the developer of the second uh, chain in the space, but it has the network effect, it has the apps, and it currently has the users, right? So how strong is that pull, right? I mean, so far it's proved to be very strong, at least it seems to be, but as the years go on, like you're asking, could that like sway of network effect and users, you know, slowly decay? It obviously would if we're talking, you know, four or five years and not much progress is made. Um, will one to two years be enough? I personally don't think so. I think, you know, we talk a lot about people just switching for uh, monetary reasons, which is obviously important. People need to be paid, right? But there's more than that to you know, a lot of people have dedicated years of knowledge building. They've learned solidity. There's, they've learned all the dev tooling on Ethereum. Um, they've just learned a lot, whether it's through like Ethub or different education sites. Like, there's a lot to you know. There's community building and going to meetups, and like a lot of my friends are in the Ethereum space now, right? There, there's a lot to this, you know, that people don't seem to talk about. And I feel like once you kind of get sucked into one of these communities and you're you know, your full-time job in it and all your friends are in it, you're going to all the meetups. It, it's more than just leaving for the technology. So, you know, I think you and I were having this discussion on Twitter a few weeks ago where I define, you know, we were, we were kind of arguing about what the definition of a maximalist is. And I defined it as someone who's hesitant to engage in discussion or experimentation of searching for potentially better optimums that may undermine a current system slash asset value. So how much time should we be spending like looking for new systems that might be better than the current systems and and that have the potential to maybe, you know, maybe create better global optimums than the current ones, even though if it may undermine our current market position or something like that. And what do you think about that definition of maximalism in general? <laughs> yeah, no, it's solid, to be honest. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, how I look at maximalism personally is if if you don't think anything besides a certain chain could win, to me, that's a maximalist, right? And I don't, like, it's obvious to me that Ethereum could lose, right? And, you know, something I talk to Anthony a lot about often is I actually more think just blockchain in general could lose. Um, so I'm not even concerned about Ethereum winning per se. I'm actually just concerned about the whole blockchain movement winning, all right? So I do think, you know, finding better technologies from projects. And the interesting thing though, is this is like all open source, right? So the Ethereum community's talked about forking parts of Polkadot over and bringing it into Ethereum. I think that's extremely valuable. I think where it could start to get dangerous as if you're trying to slosh users around to all these different technologies and chains. Like that's the sticky part. That's the hardest to come by is finding users for dApps, right? Like that's something we're still struggling with. So are you going to be able to like pull these users to a different chain and then like bring them to another and back? Like that's the tricky part. I mean, ideally if we could get all the technology shared in one area, um, that's the winning solution, but it, it's tough to do when you have six or seven chains kind of competing for the same small user group. Yeah. And I mean, on that topic of interoperability, we haven't really talked about it so far, but where do you see our interoperability going in the future? And if we have all of this, tribalism already just in in the underlying chains and now if every chain every major chain attempts its own interoperability standard so for instance cosmos has ibc now if ethereum comes up with its own thing and which is not compatible with ibc then we just continue along this path where none of the chains are interoperable where do you see this going and do you think we can at least agree on some form of interoperability standard. Yeah, so basically, I'm not sold on interoperability. Uh, it breaks a lot of uh, what we have already, I think, in terms of uh, composability. Uh, I mean, as it currently stands, right? Ethereum's main uh, main strength, I think, is the fact that everything's composable with each other. Like, obviously, Dai is integrated with a lot of different DeFi apps uh, already, uh, and it kind of like feeds off of each other. And different apps can pull from different uh, other apps and, and, and you know, it just compounds. Like people like to call it money Legos or things like that, which I think is, you know, a great way of putting it for sure. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't just involve the DeFi apps as well. It involves everything. Like you could have an Aragon DAO powering uh, a, a DeFi app or another app or, or something like that. But where, where interoperability fits into what I think, um, I'm not sure, like Ethereum 2.0, like I'm not sure how compatible that is with with Cosmos or Polkadot from an architecture uh, point of view. If you do look at Ethereum 2.0 as a system 
uh, of like just the beacon chain being the center and then the shards connecting to it. It kind of looks like an interoperable system where the shards, uh, there's 1,024 shards, which are 1,024 different blockchains that all talk to this hub called the beacon chain for security, basically. And that's that's pretty much how like Polkadot works as well uh, with, with the parachains and, and the relay chain. So the relay chain is, is the beacon chain, the parachains are the shard chains, uh, and there's the different quirks and things like that. And there's a Polkadot's are different in that they have on-chain governance and limited uh, slots for for parachains that that can that can change. Uh, whereas uh, Ethereum at the start will have the thousand twenty four shards. So yeah, looking at the architectures of it, they do look like interoperable systems. But if you're talking about even cross-chain systems, so say Bitcoin talking to Ethereum and things like that, I think that there's value value definitely in that. But I'm not sure like how like I know the way the way Cosmos works is it's got the you know the hub and then uh, chains can plug into it so that there can actually be an ether chain that plugs into it too but in terms of compatibility there and I mean I'm, I'm sure someone can build it in some way or another but it just depends like if you're trying to build it into the core protocol of Ethereum itself I don't think like maximalism or whatever would stop it from being built into it it would be more around doesn't make sense for Ethereum to add this functionality for other chains to basically plug in easily and you know, how does it affect the security of the network? How does it affect the design? How, you know, is it does it make Ethereum more complex? Does it bloat Ethereum out a bit? Uh, there's all these other concerns, I think, from an architecture perspective. I don't know if maximalism really plays into a lot of the core devs' minds, to be honest. Like, I think that's more of a Twitter, Reddit, like, I guess, a community member thing uh, rather than a, a developer thing. I think developers just work on what they you know, find exciting and things like that. There are maybe some developers that are, you know, can be considered, I guess, maximalists that openly say that they just want Ethereum to win because they love the Ethereum platform and everything like that. But, you know, I don't think they'd be against interoperability. I'm, I'm not against it. Like, you know, I'm not against Bitcoin coming onto Ethereum and acting as an asset on Ethereum. There are some people that are against it and say that it's kind of like poisonous to have Bitcoin on Ethereum because it takes away from ETH's monetary premium, right? And things like that. So, you know, I'm not sure if, if that may, like, you know, that's true or not, it does make sense on the surface level. But yeah, so I think the prevailing narrative at this point in time, I think, is that the way ETH2 is being built, uh, you know, it, it does look like an interoperable system, uh, basically. Yeah, I mean, I would say that if you're like to your point about composability, I feel like all the problems and the new paradigms you have to come up with for composability in an interoperable system are the same as that you have to do in ETH 2.0. Basically, most of the current applications br break apart in ETH 2.0, and we have to figure out, you know, shards and chains are just two two words for the same thing, in my opinion, and I, I don't think there's uh, much difference there. I think there's been a lot of work been, being done on the consensus side of ETH 2.0, but not enough, I don't know, I guess preparing application developers for the new realities of developing on ETH 2.0, which are going to be extremely, extremely different than developing on the current system. You know, currently you guys focus not so much on the development. Like, I don't think there's many like Solidity tutorials and stuff on ETH Hub, but is this something that you guys would be interested in like pursuing? Uh, yeah, we've spoken about it for quite a while that we want to develop a section of ETH Hub. It's just like what time permits, basically, because um, having a whole developer thing and keeping it up to date is a uh, massive time sink. And I think, uh, you know, getting people on board and helping with that would be a, a great way to do it, uh, whether that's through bounties or, or putting out a request for work or things like that. Uh, but yeah, to your point about, um, you know, developer considerations from get, guess the ETH2 research team and things like that, I think that we're now starting to see that come to fruition in the terms of execution environments, which is part of phase two of ETH2. So this kind of new idea around each, uh, you know, each shard or, or, or platform, I guess, on, on ETH 2.0 can have their own execution environment. And that can be like, an, you can have an EVM environment, you can have an eWASM environment, you can have an environment that just is like, acts as like a fee, uh, a fee relay layout and things like that. So it gets quite technical, but I think there are definitely considerations being made for developers now and how best to migrate developers over. But I do agree that there needs to be a lot more work done. And I think there needs to be, especially on ETH 2.0, like on ETH 1.0, there's a fair bit of work. I think Consensus has their website that is like a developer portal where you, there's a bunch of different links there. We have some stuff on ETH Hub. Uh, there are a few tutorials out there for Solidity and things like that. But yeah, I think there needs to definitely be a lot more work on ETH 2.0 side of things and getting developers up to speed. But I think, I mean, in terms of like the way Ethub could do it, we'd probably have to wait until phase two, which is the main phase where all this stuff can happen, is actually, you know, set in stone and the specs frozen for that. And we actually know what it's going to look like rather than trying to chase the researchers, which is, you know, if you ask any of the client teams, they're going to tell you that chasing the researchers is um, is really hard and, and it takes a lot of work. So 
yeah, that's that's definitely a consideration. So where can people find ETH Hub and all the wonderful things you guys are doing and how, how can people contribute? Yeah, for sure. So if you want to subscribe to our newsletter and podcast, you can go to ethhubs.substack.com. The documentation is at docs.ethhub.io, but um, all the relevant links are actually at just ethhub.io. So you can go there and, and, and find everything there. Uh, in terms of our Twitter, I'm at Sassel0x on Twitter. Uh, Eric is at E-C-O-N-O-A-R uh, on Twitter as well. Uh, you can just type in both our names and find us there too. Uh, so, yeah. Great. So we'll link to all those things in the show notes. And uh, thank you for coming on the show today. Cool. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.